Diversity of Adult Lifestyles. A major social change in recent decades is a decreased stigma attached to not maintaining what were long considered conventional families. Many adults today choose among many different uh, lifestyles and types of families. Even among my children, I've got one kid who wants to get married and have children someday, and another whose life plan is to stay single and be the fun uncle to his future nieces and nephews. The latter child certainly wouldn't be alone. 64% of 18 to 29 year olds in the United States in 2014 have never been married. And this is actually a lower percentage of single adults than some other countries like Great Britain, Germany, and Japan. Although singles are often stereotyped as being either promiscuous or desperately lonely, most do not fit either of these extremes, and they are usually quite happy and competent. There are advantages and disadvantages of single life. Although single adults might find it more challenging to form intimate relationships, confront occasional loneliness, and find a niche in, um, in a society that is marriage-oriented, there are a number of advantages. For example, single adults have more time to make decisions about their life course, more time to develop resources to meet goals, more freedom to make autonomous decisions and pursue their own interests and schedule, and more privacy. Once people reach the age of 30, they might face pressure to settle down and get married. That's usually when many single adults make a conscious decision to either marry or stay single. There has also been a dramatic rise in cohabitation in recent years. Cohabitation refers to living together in a sexual relationship without being married. In 2018, 15% of U.S. adults ages 25 to 34 and 9% ages 18 to 24 were cohabitating. Cohabitation is seen by some as a precursor to marriage, others as an ongoing lifestyle. In the United States, cohabiting arrangements tend to be short-lived. Fewer than one out of 10 last for five years. The main, reason people, uh, the main reasons why people choose to cohabitate are to spend time together, to share expenses, and to evaluate whether they, com they are compatible enough with each other for marriage. In cohabitating relationships, uh, men are more concerned with their loss of freedom, while women are more concerned about delays in getting married. Cohabitation itself comes with its own set of challenges. Family members might disapprove of the situation, which can put a strain on the relationship. Also, it's more difficult to purchase property jointly if you're not married, and the law is fuzzy on what your legal rights are in the event that the relationship ends. Finally, if the couple does decide to marry, they are actually at a higher risk of divorce if they cohabitated first. However, that isn't the case for couples who already intended to get married at the time that they decided to cohabitate. So it might be the case that cohabitation as a lifestyle might attract people who aren't strong believers in marriage in the first place. Marriage used to be the ultimate goal of adulthood. Now many people are looking for personal fulfillment both inside and outside of marriage and it's a goal that can sometimes compete with marital stability. The changing norm of male-female equality in marriage and increasingly high expectations regarding what successful marriage should look like have produced marital relationships that are more fragile and intense than marriages earlier in the 20th century. Fewer people are getting married, and people who do get married are waiting longer to do so. In 1960, the average age for first marriage in the U.S. was 23 years for men and 20 years for women. Now it's almost 30 years for men and almost 28 years for women. Still, marriage remains a goal for, for many young adults. What seems to be happening is that many people are trying to establish their careers and get financially stable before getting married. So it's not that people don't value marriage, they're just postponing it so that they're in a bit better position for healthy marital relationships. What are people looking for in a potential spouse? The majority of both men and women say that they are looking for someone who has similar ideas about having and raising children. More women than men say that it is very important that their spouse have a steady job and about a quarter of men and women are looking for someone with at least as much education as themselves. 
what makes marriages work. In his research, John Gottman identified the following factors as important predictors of success in marriage. One is establishing love maps. This means that individuals in successful marriages have personal insights and understanding of each other's life and world. They aren't psychological strangers. They are willing to share their feelings with each other. Another factor is nurturing fondness and admiration. In successful marriages, partners have good things to say about each other rather than focusing on flaws. In good marriages, spouses are good at turning towards each other regularly. They see each other as friends and they respect each other and appreciate each other's points of view despite disagreements. It doesn't mean that they never argue, but they don't let differences overwhelm the relationship. Bad marriages involve a power struggle. Good marriages involve a willingness to share power and make joint decisions. They value each other's input and seek it out. One partner wants to attend church, but the other is an atheist. One partner is a homebody, but the other wants to go out and socialize a lot. Problems like this often produce gridlock. The key to ending gridlock is not to solve the problem, but to move from gridlock to dialogue and be patient. In the meantime, the one who wants to go out and socialize can go out and socialize. The homebody can curl up with a good book. You don't have to do everything together just because you're married, you know? Finally, it is easier for partners to speak, uh, the, the easier it is for partners to speak candidly and respectfully with each other, the more likely it is that they will create shared meaning in their marriage. This includes sharing goals with their spouse and working together to achieve each other's goals. If you are engaged or considering marriage, it is highly recommended to get some premarital education starting about six months to a year before the wedding. This usually occurs in a group and focuses on relationship advice. Even in happy marriages, there are going to be sources of stress, such as work, money, in-laws, sex, housework, and child rearing. Premarital education helps ensure that you're both on the same page going into the marriage. Getting premarital education is linked with higher levels of marital satisfaction, lower, level, lower risk of divorce, and an overall improvement in the quality of the relationship. It's a worthwhile investment in order to reap the benefits of a good marriage, such as longer, healthier lives and lower, depressions, uh, lower levels of depression, anxiety, and anger over the course of the lifespan. Now, despite our best intentions, the fact of the matter is that some marriages will end in divorce. In unhappy marriages, the number one reason why people stay married is for the children. Among couples who break up, some of the most common reasons are simply growing apart, persistent arguments, cheating, lack of respect or appreciation, and domestic violence. The stress of separation and divorce places both men and women at risk for psychological and physical difficulties. Separated and divorced men and women have higher rates of psychiatric disorders, admission to psychiatric hospitals, clinical depression, alcoholism, and sleep disorders compared to married adults. In a study of the Big Five personality traits, Low levels of agreeableness and conscientiousness and high levels of neuroticism were linked to daily experiences that over time negatively impacted the relationship quality and led to marriage breakup. There isn't really a best time to marry, but if a divorce is going to occur, it usually happens early in the marriage, mostly between the fifth and tenth year of marriage. This might be because couples in rocky marriages might try to stay and work things out for a while, but if things haven't gotten better after several years, they may seek a divorce. So if you're going through a divorce or have recently gone through one, what do you do now? Here are some tips for coping with divorce. One is to think of the divorce as a chance to grow personally and to develop more positive relationships. Another is to make decisions carefully. The consequences of your decisions regarding work, lovers, and children may last a lifetime, so don't do anything rash. Focus more on the future than the past. Think about what is most important to help you go forward in your life, and then set some challenging goals and plan how to reach them. 
use your strengths and resources to cope with difficulties. Don't expect success and happiness in everything you do. As you know, quote unquote, the road to a more satisfying life is bumpy and will have many detours. And remember that you are never trapped by one pathway. You might feel defeated and have a hard time seeing how you can move on, but with time and effort, you will move forward, even if it's not the way that you anticipated.